dear colleagues, I'm uh, presenting uh, our research, which we have done over the years, and uh, looking at the same cross section where nuclear translucency is measured regarding the criteria of the Field Medicine Foundation. We will uh, go through all the things we've done during the last uh, more than 10 years to see if it's uh, valuable um, to assess the uh, fetus in that very cross section. Um, firstly, I want to show you the normal fetus. If you look at the sphenoid bone, um, which is uh, clearly visible in this middle picture, um, there behind that, uh, in the distance uh, to the um, occipital bone, there are two lines, which are essentially, firstly, the one closer to the sphenoid bone, the um, border between brainstem and fourth ventricle, uh, and uh, the next line, a little bit closer to the occipital bone, is the fourth ventricle cystina magna border. So, and I strongly recommend to look in that cross section. Other uh, markers we can uh, assess and will evaluate during this lecture, and we will show you all the things um, which we recommend to assess those markers and how valuable they are and where the borders are. Uh, um, you can also clearly see very nice the palate in the midst of the view, a little bit above uh, clearly present uh, nasal bone, thicker and brighter than the skin above. And you can also see um, as a criteria for a very good resolution, the uh, fax. And then you see also the so-called midbrain, um, which is uh, uh, essentially the thymus. And a little bit above, and you cannot differentiate it here, is the third ventricle. And that, that's actually the, the, the reason why we um, uh, uh, developed one parameter, not assessing the third ventricle, which might be an important marker for uh, absent corpus callosum, but we assessed one diameter starting from the sphenoid uh, bone, the edge, to the middle of the border uh, between uh, the midbrain diameter uh, and the fax, and then the fax diameter was uh, measured to the outer space. So uh, those are the main things we will talk about. Um, the two-line sign, again, there's two lines behind the sphenoid bone. You see also that the ratio, um, I will explain how, why, is normal between the brainstem, which is essentially the first diameter um, uh, measured from the sphenoid bone to the middle of the line between the brainstem and fourth ventricle. And uh, the second line is the, again, the border between uh, fourth ventricle system and magna, and you measure the BSOB combining the fluid filled area, so the cystina magna and the fourth ventricle, to the occipital bone starting um, from the middle of the border of, between brain stem and fourth ventricle. So we look now in the so called cystic posterior fossa abnormalities group, which are essentially uh, the Dandy Walker malformation, the vermis hyperplasia or dysplasia, flex pouch cyst, and megacystina magna, if we see something different. And yes, the ratio uh, between the brain stem, we just explained what this is, and the brain stem to occipital bone diameter is uh, decreased in those fetuses. I will show you our work regarding that later on. And you also see, and that's actually the first thing you should always look for if you uh, see uh, both lines. And in this fetus, you see clearly just one line behind the sphenoid bone between uh, sphenoid bone and the uh, occipital bone. Next thing, open spina bifida, you see clearly that there's, uh, the ratio is a little bit different. You see that the brainstem diameter looks thicker in comparison, and also the fluid fit area, well, actually this is quite logic. Due to the loss of the cerebral spinal fluid, um, there is uh, no, um, uh, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a loss of the fluid, and so the BSOV, so the fourth ventricle system and magna complex, is reduced in if you look at the diameter. However, you see a collapse system and magna there and a normal fourth ventricle. Um, and that's actually what we found over the years. And I will show you also all the data we found. And uh, finally, if you look at the palette, um, uh, the pioneer Rabbi Chawi has shown us the Kupros Nicolaitis um, that uh, there's in some fetuses a gap. We evaluated that and uh, um, found uh, an additional marker, not a marker, actually a measurement, a measurable parameter, what we always look for. Um, and this is usually decreased in the fetuses with um, cleft lip and palate. And it's important, 
Uh, that's why I put this uh, video here in that way. You see this bright spot, this blob um, there. Uh, and moving from left to right, let's just wait a little bit. This blob is just visible in the perfect cross section where there is the cleft in the front. So, and here it seems to look normal. I've just discussed it with a, a very nice paper published in the White Journal with the authors, wrote a letter to the editor. Um, hopefully, it will be accepted uh, explaining that uh, because. Uh, the only thing is you need to be good at scanning. You need to look in the region where the, uh, in a perfect mid such as the view and then tilting a little bit from left to right. Only then you will be evaluated. will be able to evaluate this very um, important marker from my point of view. However, we should always combine uh, the parameters such as the max gap sign, this so-called PND, and also Valdez Herpoveda's amazing work uh, looking at the retronasal triangle. And lastly, and for me, it's actually the most weak or the weakest uh, part at the moment. The other parameters are really strong if you look at them in a, in a uh, consecutive um, permanent way. So um, we have described abnormalities, so-called midbrain diameter and the fax diameter and put the ratio there. And we've seen that we can identify the highest population for complete absent corpus callosum due to the cranial displacement and enlargement of the third ventricle, but also uh, there's a very nice paper from a Chinese group which has shown that we have the same results um, for holoprosencephaly for some subforms, which are usually difficult to detect. So no diagnosis, however, you detect a high-risk population for uh, uh, CNS defects. Moving forward, and I will also show you amazingly new data we just submitted the paper, of, uh, we did an additional study presented already in 2016, where we've seen uh, amazing changes uh, in the fetal brain at 11 to 13 weeks. Fetuses were identified using this method in screening for open spina bifida. And then we looked at the brains and compared it with normal brains and looking at the stem cells, the progenitors, and other interesting So, but. I would always, it's always important to, to see uh, that we Im implement our methods in the uh, amazing uh, concept of primary care. We should, however, always look at the other things actually which are having the same or more relevance, such as premature birth, fetal growth restriction, um, preeclampsia, and uh, gestational diabetes. Uh, however, is it important to look for fetal defects or markers for chromosome abnormality? Answer that question now and we see clearly okay it's the second most important thing why we lose babies so we should look at it however if we want to be good obstetricians we should look for all major pregnancy outcomes so this is the typical uh, counseling uh, form this is the original slide by professor colitis you see here uh, if you have an nt of four millimeters um, you should exclude uh, if the parents want the uh, abnormal karyotypes as soon as possible. And But with our methods we just described and the new knowledge uh, derived over the years, especially from the Field Medicine Foundation, we have seen that uh, you can already um, reduce a lot of confusion and the chance will be then not 70% if you have uh, uh, excluded the uh, abnormal, uh, abnormal karyotypes and most of the major defects at 11 to 13 weeks, it will be much higher. Those fetuses again should be looked up at 16 weeks regarding the recommendations of the Philip Mason Foundation. So I'm now going into detail explaining you the methods which we used um, to, uh, um, or which we developed uh, to improve the detection rates for those so far uh, potentially detectable defects. Here we are. On the right, you see fetus with a normal NT. On the left one, uh, fetus with increased NT. Just to tell you, those fetuses were scanned with uh, in a normal pregnancy care uh, outpatient clinic of mine uh, within one hour uh, for, for the first trimester scan. And that's one not 
uh, not uh, very slim patients, completely normal patients, and they were at 12 weeks. So, and you see, it's amazing what you can see. This is the ELN184 probe from using the Philips Epic 7G. So, on the left, you see the defects which are typically uh, associated with increased in T. Amphalocyl, CDH, major cardiac abnormalities, body stock anomaly, skeletal abnormalities, and megacystis. On the right, you see the ones which are typically associated with normal NT, and that's why actually where the, these where we usually I suspect we were not so good in the past detecting those. And for the ones which are marked red, for those we have uh, and I'll show you through the slides. Uh, develop methods now to improve detection rates, especially with gastrochiasis. We don't need one because they were usually really good. However, for isolated cleft lip and palate, isolated epsilon glossum, spina bifida, open spina bifida, acrania and holoprosencephaly, and the cystic posterior fossa abnormalities, I will show you uh, screening methods to detect a true high risk population. And the other important thing is, if you don't see any of those markers, uh, the patient has a really decreased risk having such severe abnormalities. So this is the amazing slide by uh, uh, work of uh, Agiros and Galaki, which was shown in the uh, paper Challenges in the Diagnosis of Fetal non chromosomal Abnormalities, um, looking at the 45,000 uh, fetuses um, in the screening population, that the detection rate for the mentioned uh, abnormalities were so far really low, 0 to 13%, and the detection rates in our pilot studies have always been above 80%. Of course, it needs to be confirmed, but it's uh, the, one of the reasons why I did this presentation is we have now uh, so much uh, knowledge, so much research done by other groups where I'm have been not involved at all, which has confirmed our findings. So we should not, uh, again, like in social media, um, I've just seen it yesterday when people talk that if you look at the brainstem, there's some shadowing or whatever. Those are the same arguments of the people uh, when we presented our first work uh, after 2010. And uh, I will show you that the evidence is really big that you will improve using those methods, especially for so open spina bifida, all the cystic opacifers abnormalities, uh, and isolated cleft and palate, and perhaps also for a genesis of corpus callosum detection rates. What is important for me is you have a huge potential of um, uh, reassuring or being able to reassure patients, um, and that is actually the main goal. So the reason why we are now better, we have much better machines. That's it. And now if you look here, this very nice feed is 12 weeks. Uh, and this also you can see the lip and the palate 12 weeks with an EL184 transabdominal scan. Um, so the need, especially for us male gynecologists, uh, of having a vaginal scan for screening for fetal abnormalities is reducing and reducing. Uh, and this is another important thing to um, tell. One other thing, evolved imaging, you see the kidneys and the mid-flanks of the fifth uh, finger at 12 weeks. Um, you, you see much more. However, we should be really careful about those with those new machines because I would be careful of, uh, about, uh, about the counseling, uh, especially about the mid flanks of the, of the fifth finger at 12 weeks. So, first thing, first of the matter we are going through potentially detectable defects open spina bifida, and you see here, okay, a huge defect. And that's the problem. Usually, you don't have such huge defects. You have very small ones. That's why usually spina bifida was missed in the past. Looking in the mid of the review, you see our work, which we presented at the FMF World Congress in Rhodes, in Greece. And uh, there you see that the fourth ventricle is there, cisternal magna is collapsed, and the brainstem um, is increased. Just waiting a little bit for this uh, um, movie to come back. There it is, thick brainstem, and then fourth ventricle. And below, you see that the border between fourth ventricle and cisterna magna is pushed back to the occipital bone. So, because the cisterna magna. So, here on the left, you have the two line sign brainstem, fourth ventricle, cisterna magna. And on the right, you see uh, a collapsed. Cisterna magna, and you see that the ratio um, between brainstem and brainstem to occipital bone diameter is completely the other way around compared to the normal fetus on the left. It is increased in the fetuses with open spina bifida. And 
uh, it is normal in normal fetuses and perhaps we see on the lower left you can use the same method to identify the high risk population for a large proportion of um, uh, cerebral abnormalities where we so far have not been able to detect any. So first uh, work the brainstem diameter BSOB on the right, B brainstem on the left, and you see, okay, there's already a quite good separation. We were very skeptic. Uh, I measured it four times that time when we, um, uh, uh, before we published and discussed the data, because it almost looked, but I'm now happy really to show it because uh, it has been confirmed by very good people, multi-center approach. Um, and now I'm showing you this data. Usually I rarely show this because in the past uh, um, people were quite often asking, well, you have such a clear separation. Is this really possible? Yes, it is. On the right, you have this clear separation in the pilot study, especially if you take the ratio, you have some overlapping parts. If you just take one of the. Yeah, and that is the important thing. I want to thank Daniel, Daniel Rolnik, um, uh, who published with uh, Vertaschnik uh, just recently as EPUB, uh, the data. And you can see, you can almost compare the data uh, in a multi-center approach with good people such as Nicola Walpe, Tulio G, and other very, very uh, good uh, doctors um, uh, around the world. And uh, you see the brainstem was increased in their uh, study and the BSOB was decreased in their study. You see almost on the right, you see the ratio, the same uh, publication uh, picture such as in the original publication in 2010 and 11. And on the left, you see the comparison. Uh, the first marker was introduced uh, by Professor uh, uh, Ravi Chawi, uh, and uh, um, we have seen we can do a little bit better. So I will also show you perhaps why we should move away from the uh, IT to the. They have compared also other markers. Um, and that's the elegance of that amazing paper. You see the BPD sometimes is decreased. However, it's not a good screening tool. The, the, the ratio between BPD and AC, abdominal circumference, is different in many of the fetuses. However, you never achieve such a performance such with the ratio um, as they have shown. And uh, the aqueduct of Sylvius to occipital bone diameter is also having a good performance. And I'm very happy that many people have looked uh, uh, at it, but it, it looks now really that the BS to BCB ratio is the. And if you look now at the uh, uh, rock curves, uh, that is the amazing thing. You see in pink the IT, and you see actually when I first looked at the rock curves, I couldn't identify the BS to BS to BSOB ratio because it looks like the y axis. And uh, I think I don't need any more convincing data than that. And I'm very happy that we have such uh, uh, clear data now, and we should do it. I think this is one of the most important slides. Of so again, you have here the um, on the top left all the markers which you should use for the combined screening. We have a collapse of the systema magna. Um, we have the resulting single line sign as published with Matthias Shire, and we have an increased brainstem to brainstem to occipital bone diameter ratio. You see the ratio in these fetus is uh, one or bigger than one. And on top right, you see the two lines. Um, uh, and if you have those, you have a really low risk, not just, but also for open spina bifida. As we will see during the lecture, you see a clearly normal, normal uh, systema magna, and also all the other structures look normal. Uh, so, especially you should also look at the border between systema magna and fourth ventricle, as I will show you later. And then the follow up, you should be able to identify or exclude spinal bifida definitely from 16 weeks on in uh, yeah, more than 95%. On the lower left, lemon and banana sign, as described by uh, Kipus Nicolaides and Robert Chowi, um, for a later, at, later, at this stage, stage of gestation, as a correlate of the Anachiari malformation and also the defect. Those are pictures from the Field Medicine Foundation. And on the low right, you see a completely normal fetus with a normal posterior brain, normal uh, uh, posterior horns. So, and there was a big discussion, of course, uh, and I was waiting especially from the data from Berlin, the big prospective trial, and they had a strange cutoff, which is usually never used um, uh, in this field. They took the 99th centile, came to a strange conclusion, but if you look at the data, the data is really good. IT performance was 45% in detection for open spina bifida, and now 
if you look there with the ratio, and even they wrote something really strange in the abstract, uh, don't worry, um, the detection rate was above 80% using that method. It was the best marker in there in the biggest prospective study too. And if you look at uh, Sistana Magna, there was also a high detection rate, a little bit lower, uh, 74%. We managed to uh, place the letter to the editor with this discussion I just had and explained to you. Uh, unfortunately, uh, not in the Degum Journal where the paper was published, uh, it was reviewed, accepted, and then not printed. Uh, but we managed to uh, have the same discussion in 2017 um, because there was another nice study from Turkey, uh, and uh, we discussed it with the authors there um, to, um, yeah, to finally show what is reasonable from our point of view. And of course, we should not forget about neural tube defects and folate. Folate has been shown uh, to reduce many uh, the incidence of many abnormalities, and it's dose dependent. We know that, but we will never reduce uh, or eliminate all of spina bifida cases. I strongly recommend to read the Go paper, folic acid in pregnancy and fetal outcome. So here is uh, something where I'm really happy. We just submitted the paper now, finally, of the updated uh, um, uh, study where we with, with our method, which I've just shown you, using the BS to BS to B ratio um, uh, and the single line sign eliminated uh, already in the early 2012, 13, 14 uh, patients um, at 12 weeks when they decided to have a termination. We looked at the brain of the fetuses um, with the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics with the group of Hüttner, and I want to thank uh, 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 Professor Hüttner and Professor Fietz, uh, Simone Fietz, who we have been working over the years on that. And I'm very, very happy now, finally, um, and I will show it next year at the, uh, at the big congresses around the world, uh, what we have found. I will show you what I've presented in uh, Nice and at, uh, at the FMF World Congress uh, in 2014, and what I presented at the ESORC in Barcelona. Um, first, we need to explain neurons are, there's only one type of uh, cells which are able to build neurons, and those are just called neural progenitors. Um, and if you, you see in so-called lysencephalic uh, fe uh, fetuses or um, animals, you have a, a different way of activated uh, um, progenitors. So if the progenitors uh, are disturbed, you have a higher chance of developing a lysencephaly. And in humans, you have a gerencephalic cortex and normally the progenitors are working so that we have a garation. If not, then uh, uh, the lesson carefully um, result. So, and these are the basic studies Professor Fietz and Professor Hutner did at the Max Planck Institute uh, in uh, in uh, Dresden, and we found in in those fetuses with, which had a spina bifida. Now, compared to the ones um, which had um, uh, which were normal. And those are the results, and they are really amazing. If you look at the telencephalic diameter on the left in the normal fetus, the so called ventricular zone, DZ, and supraventricular zone, uh, um, uh, the diameter compared at this early stage in fetus of spina bifida uh, is already reduced, the telencephalic diameter. And I think that's quite. And the effect is even bigger. Um, if you look at the 15 weeks fetus normal and compared to the open spina bifida fetus, which uh, uh, yeah on the on the right. Uh, if you look now at the activity uh, of the progenitors, uh, you see also this is reduced, especially in the uh, SVZ, and that's the important area of the brain. Yeah, so, and you see also the, the way the color is displayed shows a reduced activity um, uh, of the uh, of those um, uh, structures. And in the ventricular zone, which is a little bit less important, there's also an effect which is, however, not that remarkable like the one. So, uh, 
here you have a uh, dandy walker malformation um fetus in uh, with complete agenda of the cerebral vermis we looked again uh, because we asked ourselves like in spina bifida well if we can see it at 20 weeks in the vast majority why not at 12 weeks so we look for the correlate and you see there's a big hole let's call it like that behind the brainstem there and actually that's the fourth ventricle uh sister and magna superventricle um which we also know is uh later uh visible after um 20 weeks and uh, the cystic posterior fossa abnormalities we already have explained there are several uh, conditions which we uh, count into that so we will see if we can have shown to improve detection rates for uh, cystic posterior fossa abnormalities and here we are on the right the brainstem looks narrowed however statistically not significant in our study uh, and the b or b is increased in those fetuses and if you look at the on the left uh, uh, there, it looks completely normal. The brainstem appears thicker, and the BS, uh, OB looks, uh, in comparison, you have the second line separating the fourth ventricle, cisterna magna, uh, and so you don't have a link, a single line sign like on the right. So, with one method, assessing the BS to BS -B ratio, we have now manifested, uh, we can assess two so called potentially detectable defect groups. Such as the cystic posterior fossa abnormalities, and and I will show you the uh, pictures from the first study we did uh, with uh, Elena Sankovskaya and Alfred Abu Hamad uh, from Norfolk, Virginia, and I'm very happy about our work we've done. On the top, you see four normal fetuses, and with the same CRL below uh, fetuses which had such condition, and you see there's a huge gap now between fourth ventricle. And cisterna magna, you see just a, a single line sign clearly now, and um, uh, like a big hole uh, in uh, in the posterior fossa behind the brainstem. The uh, um, measurements we apply here, you see, okay, in normals on top, and there you see, well, the ratio is really different. It is decreased because the brainstem looks a little bit narrow and the area behind is bigger, and that is the important thing. And all those fetuses. Uh, on uh, below shown uh, had a completely absent vermis, a maximum version of the dendy. So here the the the, uh, the box and whisker plots um, re uh, eliminating the CRL. So you see brainstem diameter a tendency to be narrower, however not significant. Yeah. Here you see the BSOB. Okay, well increased in those fetuses which were affected having a completely absent vermis uh, dendy walker malformation. So, and if you look to see the ratio, there's an almost clear separation um, or is a clear separation for those fetuses. So those are the uh, dendy walker fetuses with complete uh, genesis of the cerebral. Okay, we can also see looking using 3D ultrasound, uh, see if it's really there. Um, Elena Sinkovskaya looked at that and uh, presented that um uh, several times and the important thing for me is and actually I'm really happy other people have shown Bornstein and Yukolanu, for instance, that it also works for all the other um, uh, abnormalities, cystic posterior fossa abnormalities. So, the high risk population for many, many of those things. And then there's one other nice work done by Paolo Volpe, Bonella Muto, Rambuscos, uh, um, um, uh, and Fanelli, and other good colleagues, which has shown, have confirmed, the, that they had the, an increased BSOB uh, in uh, fetuses with their cystic posterior fossa abnormalities. And um, if you especially look at the uh, the Walker uh, fetuses, they all had an increased BSOB.
So, and there's also some, has been some nice work done um, by Paolo Wald by looking later on, assessing the brainstem vermis angle. And there's also a case report uh, at 14 weeks looking at the brainstem vermis angle uh, seen. Uh, the, the essential idea is that the brainstem uh, vermis angle is uh, lower and normal and increasing uh, with the severity of the um, posterior fossa abnormality. So we should follow up the patients after 18 weeks assessing this uh, important development by Paolo Walper, um, published in 2012. You see it here again, displayed and how it is assessed. So then you can make the diagnosis. You have a risk assessment at 12 weeks and you will have the diagnosis after 17 or 18 weeks. And this is a, a very nice work from uh, uh, the Malinger group, uh, Gustavo Malinger. He has shown that after 18 weeks, you can assess the vermis in a sagittal uh, way, uh, creating normal curves, which we should use also for the differential method. And also for posterior fossa abnormalities, we should always use, because of the differential diagnosis, MRI, if we have. So risk assessment again, ratio between brainstem, brainstem and oxybodometer is decreased, single line sign or nor border uh, between fourth ventricle and systema magna. And on the right, you see a normal fetus. And then you have the differential diagnosis using ultrasound and MRI, looking at the vermis and the brainstem vermis angle um, uh, and at uh, and other cross sections after. So, because why should we look at 18 weeks and be careful? On the right, you see mega systema magna and black pouches have a, a regression tendency of 30 to 40%. So they can get normal. Um, and they have a much better outcome, of course, compared to worms hyperplasia and dendy walker malformation. So, Next thing, then you walk uh, on affirmation, we have seen you have a screening tool, you look for a corpus callosum agenesis now, and you see yellow here, the third ventricle uh, above the thalamus, they look almost the same if you look in the B mode, um, and that might be a problem, however, uh, that's, we have created one measurement, the midbrain diameter, uh, which is the longest distance between edge of sphenoid bone to the, um, uh, um, middle of border between uh, 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 third ventricle uh, midbrain and the uh, fax to uh, the fax diameter was measured from middle of the border uh, of this border to the fax outer. And you see on the left from Penfield and Hindman, uh, you have seen the third ventricle is being elevated and um, has a bigger size um, uh, in affected uh, human beings. And so we thought we perhaps might use the looking at the correlate at 11 to 15 weeks on the left you see midbrain diameter tends to be increased there's a tendency uh, in the affected fetuses Falx diameter it tends to be decreased however the uh, separation we see and the ratio above one in the majority of fetuses um, when they were affected um, because uh, using this method on the right you see normal fetus on the left an abnormal one um, using this method, you should be really careful because there's an looking at our proposed strategy on the left, you see that you should look for the midbrain and fax diameter if it's above the 90th centile, and then in addition, you should also look if you have suspicious cases for the periclosal flow because then you will reduce the false positive rate extremely. And on the right, you see a completely normal fetus with a normal ratio. And there I would not use uh, car doppler at the moment. However, you can do it in the highest populations, of course, as we have seen um, before. And here you see on the lower left the, uh, the teardrop sign and the profile where you can't visualize the, um, the corpus callosum. And on the uh, lower right, you see um, the completely normal fetus.
be careful, please be careful, because a Chinese paper, the group of Venya, has shown um, that for uh, this method also works in fetuses with follow up cephaly and has showing the same, same results. You don't have an abnormal uh, diagnosis, you have a high risk population, or you can reassure patients, which is the. So, last abnormality isolated cleft of palate. You see here a video which is completely free to download from the original publication um, as a supplement. You see the white blob. Which we measure then, uh, moving from left to right again, you will uh, see a so uh, normal palette, but you need to identify the uh, cleft area. Uh, and you want to see that, and you can you see that in the mid surgery view as we have shown, and actually not missed any in the prospective uh, study. So. Here is the method explained on top right a figure showing the posterior portion of the palatine process and then you measure in the abnormal one on the lower right and in the middle in the normal one and uh, in this figure the virtually the PMD which is the shortest hypergenic distance from ossified upper posterior palatine process to anterior ossified portion without interruption of more than 1.5 millimeter as defined by Rabbi Chowi and the Kirkus Nicolaitis, the so-called maxillary gap. Um, uh, the, uh, you see it clearly that if you look at the results in 300 consecutive cases, that four of the five had a, a, a decreased uh, less than fifth percentile um, uh, measurement of the PMD and the only one in the group was in the lower normal range. So there's a box and whisker plots you see here, and there's almost a clear separation between those two groups. The proposed strategy, looking for the PMD, perfectly tilting from left to right, um, or if you have a maximum of gap sign, which is more than 1.5 millimeter, and then you should also, in addition, use Sepoveda's method, then the retronasal triangle. Uh, and look if it's normal. And then you have the high-risk population clearly, uh, and uh, you should be able to exclude from 16 weeks on definitely if there's a cleft there or not. And on the lower left, you see the typical abnormal fetus. So, and actually what we see, what we measure is this. I just found it after we published it, uh, discussed it with a family member who is a, a surgeon, a, a maxilla of a vandertist, and I asked, her, well, what do you really see if there's a patient with cleft lip palate? She said, she said, there's just an ossified small something in the front beside the cleft in the midline. And this is what we see. You see from an amazing paper from Kavarachal Manroy, okay, it has to be a normal as long as soon as the palate is involved. And of course, in the cleft lip, as shown on the left, the PMD. So, and if you look in the first picture ever published by Nicopus Nicolaitis, you see most likely this fetus had a cleft lip and palate. The PMD was reduced, and also there is a maxillary gap there, uh, we shown. And also, if you look at the posterior fossa, actually it looks like that there's a spina bifida there because the ratio between brain stem and brain stem to occipital bone diameter uh, is above one in this fetus. So, and I'm very happy that uh, the SMFM uh, and uh, Barry Benazov have, have taken already on our paper into consideration for their uh, consult series. Concluding, counseling expects 11 to 15 weeks scan. You know the detection rates. I will show you here what we already can see at 12 weeks. And if you look really fair and clear, uh, you see what an amazing work the Film Medicine Foundation has done over the years. Um, and uh, actually at 20 weeks, we are quite often just a little bit better or not so good, actually. So, and one thing, I also created a lecture about that. There's a very nice paper from Panayotava and Nicolaitis uh, the, about morbidly arterial placenta, 100% detection rate, 6% pos positive rate only for uh, all the subforms, placenta accreta, increta, percreta, and that is amazing at 11 to 13 weeks and 16 weeks having such an amazing additional screening. So to conclude, we can now assess, reassure using the methods BS, BSOB, PMD, and midbrain and fax diameter because we can 
tell a patient which had perhaps as uh, that you walk on my formation that she that she not that that the likelihood is really though having one um uh, if the uh, picture looks like in the middle picture and a spina bifida is very unlikely if you have a picture like in the middle picture and a cleft open palate is very very unlikely again if you have such a normal maxilla like in the center and on the right you see a completely different midbrain of hex diameter ratio so uh, in the middle picture of course and that is the goal we want to reassure patients um uh, then uh, you uh, have a really low risk if it's uh, as displayed in the in the middle picture so i hope you have enjoyed a little bit what we've done over the years and if you have any questions just give me a ring the number is displayed there or give me an email thank you very very much for your patience and goodbye.